You're listening to the Paul Cardall Podcast. When we listen to someone's story and ideas, we build bridges to connect with others. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my podcast. I'm Paul Cardall. I appreciate you being here. Of course, if you're here for the first time, I invite you to subscribe wherever you're listening. And at the end of the podcast, if you liked what you heard, go ahead and leave a review. When I first came to Nashville, I didn't know a lot of people. I was invited to a a house party where people were performing. This was a gathering by Norman Tolk and his wife. She was a graduate of Juilliard and would teach a lot of the recording artists' children piano. So here I was at this event meeting a few people. One of the gentlemen there was John Jennings, who happened to be the vice president of Royer Lab Microphones pretty big deal. Foo Fighters love John. They use his mics and everything they do. Dave Grohl is a big fan. And John supplies these microphones to everyone from rock and roll to classical music. Well, anyways, I sat and I played Life and Death from my album New Life. This was the first album after my heart transplant where there was some commercial success. It was number one on the billboard, and Life and Death was one of those pieces that propelled it. This was a song that I arranged based on a small theme Michael Giacchino wrote for the TV show Lost. I thought it was such a beautiful piece of music, I wanted to expand on it.
the song just took off, there are hundreds of millions of streams, thanks to you. And uh, it was in a, such a beautiful way, and I felt so blessed because it enabled me to do a lot more, having done that piece. Well, I sat down at the piano at this house party, and I began to play that piece. Afterwards, John Jennings came over and just was so gracious. He complimented the way I was doing the arpeggio flow, not only in the left hand, but later in the right hand, and just the tenderness of the piece of music. And he said, you know, there's a gentleman, Michael Bishop. He's a classical recording engineer. He used to be the, one of the head guys at Tlark which was a, a record label in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that uh, released a lot of classical music. And not being classically trained, of course, I was somewhat skeptical and nervous that he would even be interested in a pianist like me who is self-taught. He said, no, you guys should get together because I think what you should do is get into a room with him and just improvise. Just sit there and play what's in your heart. I said, well, I've never done this for an album. He said, no, you should get in a room with him. He'll sit in the booth and he will capture what you're doing so tenderly in such a beautiful way. I think you'll really enjoy it. Well, he arranged the connection with Michael. Anytime you record piano solos, it's so vulnerable. You have to play it specific. And if you don't get the right notes or you mess up, you have to do it all over again. When I got ready to record this album, I had been working with Michael Bishop, who's a phenomenal professional engineer. He's got 10 Grammys. This setup is very specific to Paul's music and in this instance for this program. Michael is a genius because what he has done for this recording is for the first time in my career, I've had fantastic engineers. But for the first time in my career, he has mic'd the Steinway to my music, to my style. Like a photographer who has to zoom in to get the best shot. He knows how to zoom in the microphones and all the technology so that he captures me at my finest. We are here in this amazing room with uh, two incredible recording people in the industry. Uh, John Jennings, who is Vice President of Royer Labs. I heard Paul's playing and just heard one of the most beautiful right hands I, I'd ever heard. It was just, it's such a, an exceptional tonality. And I thought, man, these two need to get together. I mean, with your sensitivity so to an instrument and your knowledge of mic technique and, and recording technique and then Paul's touch, it's like, man, this is really gonna be special. So it's been fantastic to uh, listen to what's going down here and that right hand I've heard standing in a room with Paul is coming through on the recordings. When that comes through the that's monitors wonderful. in the control room, that's, that's a really special thing. And I think you're capturing the feel, the real instrument, like the intention of the instrument in the room. And basically, what I'm, the way I'm using the microphones <clears throat> and the recording setup is to get out of the way of that and let what Paul is doing come through. That's, the, that's really the secret to it, is to get out of the way or at least give the impression that there yeah. is nothing between the listener and the artist. Paul's music and his approach with the piano is very reverent. He leaves a lot of space, very relaxed, very introspective, and he just pulls the listener right into his space very nicely. All the projects I've done have a purpose. I don't just, I don't just make music to make music. It has to be connected with something that makes things better. For whatever reason, that day I was able to record over 42 ideas that they all felt were, were songs. And I wasn't sure walking away from that, but after I would listen back to what Michael had done and then my performance and what was coming out of my heart, 
we narrowed it down to, I think, 18 pieces, and it became the album Peaceful Piano. And I love that record because it captures a moment where I started to understand a gift that God had given me, which is the ability to create on the fly human emotion. And Michael and I talked about doing another record. Well, COVID happened and uh, we kept connecting. But unfortunately, Michael was up on the ladder at his home trying to fix some things and he fell. And he had tragically passed away. This was a huge loss to the industry. He was a mentor, a teacher, a guide. He was also a father and a husband. And uh, he's beloved, and it's sad that he's gone. I was devastated. I didn't think I'd ever be able to do a project in that way because he was the guy. Well, John said you ought to talk to his business partner, Thomas Moore. Well, I spoke with Thomas, and we started to plan. And tragically, Thomas passed away. I was frustrated. Well, I went ahead and I did that project, The Broken Miracle, which was where songs were pre-written. I gathered Grammy-winning artists like Ty Herndon, nominees like Thompson Square, Tyler Glenn from Neon Trees, and of course, David Archuleta, who is beloved and very popular among my fans, and uh, a few other artists. And it was an incredible experience, but you know that uh, most of you prefer the piano music. But that was a great opportunity to connect with these artists and be around musicians who I feel are much better than I am and learn and connect and grow and which is something we're always trying to do, right? We want to get better at our gifts. We want to get better at whatever we're doing. And you do have to surround yourself with people who are much smarter and better, like I did with Michael Bishop and the intention of Thomas More. Well, I put things off, put things off, and then John Jennings, of course, said, we'll talk to the remaining partner, Robert Friedrich. And I just put it off. I said, John, I can't do that. Well, Robert and I ended up connecting, and Robert said, you know, listen, let's do this in Michael's honor. Let's get together. We'll try to get at Oberlin. Of course, with the pandemic, we weren't able to get to Oberlin. And eventually, we went to Brea, Ohio, to Baldwin Wallace University, uh, another fantastic music conservatory. And you're noticing that Ohio has a pattern between the Cleveland Institute of Music, uh, Oberlin College, and of course, Baldwin Wallace University. And the thing that was unique about Baldwin Wallace, this is where the first national, well, it was international Bach competition began. So of course, not being trained classically in the word Bach, uh, I was a little intimidated to go to this theater where the piano would be to sit down and improvise. But we got everything arranged, and I hired a film crew this time because I don't think any of you have ever seen a top view of me playing these pieces. Now, when it's written on sheet music, you perform it a certain way. But to watch the way I do it is not necessarily the correct way. There's other musicians who don't play instruments correctly. Paul McCartney from the Beatles. He plays the guitar left-handed. And so did Jimi Hendrix. And these are people like myself who learn to play by ear. And that doesn't mean I just put my ear down on the piano and start pounding. It means that I can hear something or feel something and interpret that by playing. So there we were in Baldwin Wallace University's theater. I had a beautiful concert grand piano and I began to improvise with all these cameras around me, all these microphones around me. And of course, that is going to be available. You'll be able to watch these performances in a very intimate setting as though I'm in your living room performing these thought-provoking, mellow, beautiful pieces that God just poured through me. Now, among those pieces, 
there were a couple of hymns that I wanted to do because I started by doing hymns. This is my childhood. This is my heritage. For 40 years, I was actively pursuing uh, the hymns and understanding the hymns, playing the hymns, because they bring me and so many people closer to the divine. And there was a hymn that I would sing as a child, very simple, and uh, loved it even into my adulthood and love it today. It's called Love One Another. It's based on the great commandment that the Lord gave, which is to love one another as you love yourself. And uh, if there's a time where we truly love ourselves, it is now. We need to love one another, as Christ said. And uh, when we do, we seem to gather more community, associates, people who can support us as we continue to support them with that love. That is the piece I want to talk about today, because in this process of recording this song, I intentionally wanted to do it in a way like my piece, Redeemer, which is a hymn based on I Know My Redeemer Lives. And I did this piece, I think, back in 2003. I gathered a piano version, and then I hired Marshall McDonald and Stephen Sharp Nelson. Stephen Sharp Nelson is now in the piano, guys. He was one of my artists when I had a record label, Stone Angel Music. We did a cello record for him called Sacred Cello. It took off. It uh, charted on the billboard and did a little better than Yo-Yo Ma one particular year, which was shocking to the Utah community. We were local musicians striving to have our music heard outside of that market. And uh, thanks to you, it has expanded to some 160 countries, and now Steve is performing as well throughout the world with John Schmidt as the Piano Guys. Well, to backtrack, they came up with such a gorgeous orchestral arrangement for my piano arrangement of I Know My Redeemer Lives, the song known as Redeemer, and thanks to you, there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of streams. People all over the world that have heard that piece, particularly experiences that I've received in emails life-changing experiences I never expected.
go into the studio and we record these pieces, we never know the impact. You never know the impact you have when you make a little effort to do something that you think will help the world. It's a rippling effect as you throw your service into a pond. It affects everything. So we recorded this piece and uh, Redeemer put it out into the world. And shortly after the second Iraq situation, after years after 9-11, I received an email from a young man in, from Iraq. He said that he was working on a military base, a U.S. military base. All his family had been killed in the war. And he was contemplating suicide. He was walking the halls of this army facility when he heard a melody. And the melody started to play a little louder as he walked closer to this office, looked in, and an officer was playing Redeemer. He said in the moment that those strings came in, uh, in the second half, he felt Allah say to him, I love you, you need to live. And he made that decision that day that he would live. And these are the type of things that happen that we have no control over. That email was life-changing for me because for the first time I was seeing something happen internationally with simple little piano music with beautiful arrangements. Well, I started working on Love One Another right there in the Baldwin Wallace Theater. And it was taking some time to actually get because I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted it to be like Redeemer. And when I strive for perfection, and you can probably totally relate to this, when you strive for perfection, you overthink. And you begin to have anxiety and stress. And often my wife will say, you're an artist, you overthink, you want everything perfect. Just let things happen naturally. I've been told that many times when I wrote One by One with an LDS apostle, David Bednar. This was a hymn that he wanted for the LDS church. He said, just let it happen naturally. Don't force it and it'll come to you. And over time, it, it came to me in the middle of the night, and I went and I wrote the melody for one by one, and then he added the lyrics. Well, this was the same situation with Love One Another. I was stressed. I was trying to get it correct. And so I put it on pause. And then I performed all these other improvisational, improvisational pieces that, oh, wow. <laughs> it is some of the best melodies and harmonies and beauty in the piano that will roll out this year that I will give to you this year. I'm so excited about such beauty. And I don't think I've had music this beautiful given to me from the Lord since New Life. And it's really not my music. It belongs to Him. It uh, just flows through me because He loves you and He wants to communicate that through music. There's no lyrics. So each of you will receive what you need to know. That's the beauty. And when we listen, if we listen close enough, I believe we will hear God tell us, I love you. And that's always been the purpose of my music, to help heal your heart. My heart's been healed time and time again. So love one another just was still on my mind, and then at the end of the day, I said, well, let me just try this. And I just didn't overthink it. I just sat and played what was in my heart, thinking of everything God had done for me, and everything God had done for so many of you that you've shared with me. There's a fan of mine that I want to talk about. Her name is Zoe. Zoe is in a wheelchair. She attends every performance I do in Salt Lake City. She's always been a big fan. She sends me pictures of wearing my merch. 
But what I love about her is her smile and her infectious optimism, regardless of her circumstance. She's had numberless, countless medical procedures, brain surgeries. Well, she sent me a picture one day of her paragliding. Have you ever paraglided? This is where you go up in the air in some type of parachute and you glide. Well, she had an expert uh, connect her in her wheelchair. She doesn't keep her struggles from letting her live life. She's an inspiration. This is a young woman who loves with all her heart. And I was thinking about her when I was recording Love One Another. I was thinking about a young girl who after my second heart surgery, when I woke up out of the intensive care, uh, in the intensive care was this young girl. I'd written a song years ago on my first album, Sign of Affection, about her called Gone Home. Her name was Stephanie. I was thinking about her because she was dying. She had some form of cystic fibrosis. She had a trachea tube. And um, there she was on the side of my bed, just smiling at me with her beautiful smile. She had dark eyes, a little sunken. She was pale. You could tell she wasn't doing well, but she radiated like an angel. And it was as though she was trying to convey to me and give to me all of the positive energy she had so that I could get well. I had battled and battled that surgery and they had to cut my chest open three different times. They ended up giving me a pacemaker. This was the Fontan procedure. I remember the third time they had to send me back in because there was an error. I remember asking my dad, Dad, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go to heaven. He said to me, son, and I don't know where he got the strength, but as a father, he disciplined me. He said, son, you go in there and you have that surgery and you live. You're supposed to live to be a man. This was something that was promised me as a child from a pastor, a priesthood leader, a man named Howard W. Hunter came in and prayed over me and said I would live to be a man. You know, I'm going to be 50 years old and I tell my wife all the time, uh, someday I'll be a man. So I'm still living. Well, this little girl after that was an angel for me. And of course, after I left the hospital six months later, I learned that she had passed away. She spent the final days of her life visiting patients. And then, of course, years later, as I was waiting for my heart transplant, they put me in a children's hospital because the experts who understand my anatomy, not a lot of us had survived, were mainly in the children's hospital. We have a rising generation of people who are surviving complex heart defects, and the adult hospitals are preparing for this. But we have a ways to go in educating communities, particularly doctors and hospital administrators of the growing need. But we're seeing results. I was at the uh, CVCT, the cardiovascular clinical trialists that uh, bring in the FDA president and the FDA commissioner and the uh, NIH that fund a lot of the progress in medical procedures and advancements. And we're having some impact there, and there's, of course, more to come on that. I'll be sharing that with you throughout this year as well. But, man, you know, when I'm in that hospital waiting as an adult, I'm surrounded by other children who have congenital heart disease, and many had had valve replacements. I went into the room of one kid who, a Polynesian kid from Provo, Utah, and I saw him and I noticed on uh, the table, on the table before him, he had some type of pine wood. You know, Boy Scouts get pine wood to make pine wood derby cars and then they race them, they carve them, you make them, you put the CO2 cartridge in there with the wheels and then they go, they go. And it's a fun little competition. 
Well, he was carving pine wood, and he was making little sheep. And I said, what are the sheep for? He says, well, I've got 12 brothers and sisters at home. <laughs> Which is quite a load. And he said, I'm making one of these for each one of them. They haven't been able to visit me. We have a station wagon. We can't fit everybody. But, uh, you know, I just had the valve replaced. I'm getting better and I'll go home. You know, he could have been playing video games or watch, or watching The Simpsons, but he was there expressing love for his siblings by creating something to give to them. He said, they've been praying for me, and I'm all well, and I'm going home. So these are the type of people that I've been fortunate to interact with and, of course, my surgeon prior to the heart transplant said, look, Paul, you've, you're an adult. A lot of these kids have never been able to fall in love like you, never gone to college, never been married, don't know what it's like to have a child, but you've experienced some remarkable things in your life. Why don't you get out of this room with your oxygen? I know you're not feeling well, but get out of your room and meet some of these kids. In doing that, that helped prepare me for the transplant, which became a beautiful success. God orchestrated a beautiful miracle. Well, all of these thoughts were in my head as I played just naturally love one another. share that peace with you and with the world and hope that you'll feel as you listen to that peace love that you'll want to go out and surround yourself with others who love be a light in the world and to have compassion and all of the pieces that I'll be rolling out this year the big release will be in September but we'll be releasing pieces, I think, every other month. So be aware of that. Get on my mailing list, paulcardall.com. Go over there under subscribe. Subscribe to the All Heart community. And I'll send out newsletters with information of when things are going to happen. Of course, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram to be aware of these things. This is going to be a piece of music. When you put this on in your home, the kids will mellow out. You'll feel peace. And again, with all my music, it is a tool, a resource for you to create an atmosphere of peace wherever you are. So with that, I want to thank you for joining me on this podcast. Remember to subscribe and to review wherever you listen. 
I love you guys. We'll talk soon. You took my scars, bruises and broken heart, and numbed all the pain. Show me how to heal, and now I don't feel broken anymore. Number one, Billboard pianist Paul Cardall. Do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Netto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com. Paul greatly appreciates your feedback. Please subscribe to the Paul Cardall Podcast wherever you listen.